have the sixth graders. I was looking for a few of you. Um, and so hopefully this gentleman looks familiar. Yeah. Kevin Skarupa from He's a weather dude. You are. Weather, yeah. So he's going to come and he's here, actually, and he's going to chat with us for a little bit about weather and try to get this rolling. But in the meantime, he's probably got some things he could talk to you about, so we're going to let him do that. So, thanks. Welcome. Hi, you guys doing? Good. Good. Um, I, I have a great job, but it is not for any of the first five or six reasons you probably imagine. Uh, we don't make millions and millions of dollars. We don't drive around in really cool, expensive sports cars. We don't live in huge mansions. We don't do this to be famous or recognized wherever we go or anything like that. Uh, turns out since about age seven, I've been interested in weather. Uh, for me, it was a big winter storm when I was a kid that happened on a Monday. And I was off from school for snow days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So all week, I'm saying to myself, how in the world can something like this happen when the snow is up over my head? And how could it please happen again? So, went to the library, started reading books about weather, noticed that there was something called the Weather Channel on my television system at home, and got the weather station for my backyard when I was 12, and, and, I was <coughs> and for most meteorologists, they have that story. Whether it's a hurricane coming up the coast, a tornado two towns over, there's something that gets them interested in weather enough that they want to actually pursue it further down the line. And I could say for Mike, Josh, Haley, and myself, where we all have that same love of weather. Um, we don't really dread coming to work every day. Maybe in these kind of circumstances where the weather doesn't seem to want to officially turn to spring, maybe we dread it a little bit because we realize the message people don't want to hear it. But other than that, we, we, we enjoy what we do. And it's because the weather is different every single day. Meteorology is basically a 500 piece puzzle on my table. We know a lot about the pieces. We know a lot about the sun, the ocean currents, the atmosphere. But it's how all of those pieces interconnect, change, and affect each other that we're completely not at yet. We've been using computers for about 40 years to try to figure a lot of these things out. And we've made some really good headway. When I started on television over 20 years ago, our extended forecast was three days long. It's now seven. Internet can get you 10 to 15 day forecasts. And when I would tell people that snow was going to start in the afternoon, that was a perfectly good forecast. Now, people want to know what hour it's going to start, which in itself is a little crazy. But that's kind of where our science has come along. And if you think about it, it is one of those scenarios that we try to predict a snowstorm three or four days before it's even a thing out over the ocean coming at us. That's kind of where we are. And so there's only a certain point we're going to be able to get to. And the computers are really good. There's nine different sets of maps these days. They come in from all over the world. Uh, Japan, Brazil, Australia, Canada, Europe, <coughs> the United States. And they're all run through human-made math equations. So they're not like the computers you guys use where you know they can make extreme calculations or um, they can memorize a zillion different things. They're only as good as the information that the humans put into them. And humans aren't perfect, so the computer maps aren't going to be perfect, and out of the 200 maps I look at every morning, there can be days where half of them are completely wrong. And it's up to me to try to figure out which ones I'm going to use that day, and hopefully I choose correct, because if I don't, it's a very bad day for the meteorologist. So in our world, it's different than a lot of the other sciences you have at school. It's not chemistry. It's not geology. It's not biology. It's, it's one where we're trying to figure out the future. At the same time, we know, again, a lot about the individual people. That's kind of where we are right now. And we need scientists. We need people in the how and the why. Out of the tens of thousands of meteorologists <coughs> across the world, um, us TV people pointing at numbers all day is, is a very small fraction of that. There, there are people working for the National Weather Service. Very stressful job because they have to issue the tornado warnings. You guys may remember back to July 4th weekend last year where we had very heavy rain, the crazy storm, the tornado warning, and all that stuff is warnings issued by the National Weather Service. And then there is the, uh, the wonderful um, researchers who fly into hurricanes and chase tornadoes. You will notice if you watch me on TV, I'm never the one standing a few feet of snow or dangling from the palm tree. <coughs> I am very happy when it's 
15 degrees outside to be in the office in front of the computers with my large ice cup of coffee very early in the morning. I, I don't need to be out in that stuff to talk about it all day. So it is a wonderful job, and there's a lot of different opportunities in it, but in the end, we need scientists. We need the people trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. So while we know a lot more than we did 20 years ago, there isn't going to be this magic moment in five or 10 years where we're going to know everything about our science. And so a lot of what still needs to be put together and those pieces of the puzzle put together are still really important pieces to the puzzle that we don't have the answers completely to. Um, what I'm going to show you guys today um, is basically kind of a this is your life, first of all. And it's the amazing, uh, basically the laundry list of storms we've had basically in your life. The last 12 or 13 years has been an incredible run on all different types of weather. Oh. Closed? Looks like it is kind of closed. It's never happened. One more book. Okay. 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 Maybe another Troy book. Okay. That would be symbolic. Hey. Right. Right. Yes. So, <clears throat> first of all, that light blue jacket back in 1995, I like to think was in style. That is my first job out of school. Best piece of advice I ever got in my internship at Hartford, Connecticut was be willing to go anywhere. Anywhere for me was Northern Iowa. Uh, job right out of school, grew up in Connecticut, went to school about 45 minutes from here at Linden State College in Vermont. And I got sent to Iowa for my first job. It was a paycheck, it was five days a week. But you can make all the rookie mistakes. You get on the air sometimes for three or four hours straight during tornado uh, outbreaks. And you stand in two feet of snow during blizzards, which, while I don't like it now, I realized back then I had pretty good excitement for weather back then. And then you bounce around. Three years there, three years in Florida, three years in Tennessee, and now back here for the last 13. Uh, my wife was born and raised in Merrimack, so happy wife, happy life. <laughs> So why is the weather unique? I mean, everywhere I've worked, people say, like, wait five minutes. Well, we have all four seasons. Some obviously last longer than others. You step outside for five minutes. Uh, every wind direction gives us a different air mass. It's not always that way everywhere we go. Um, the air out of Canada, cold and dry. The wind out of the ocean right now, the water temperature, sadly, at Hampton Beach right now, is the exact same water temperature than when I jumped in the ocean for Special Olympics on February 3rd. I don't know when that's going to warm up, but we are five weeks from Memorial Day. It's going to get quite sad very soon. Um, and then each different wind direction will give us something different, and that's why it makes the weather change here very, very quickly. Three guides to our seasons. We hear a lot about El Nino and La Nina, the warming and the cooling of the Pacific, but we'll talk about three others. Again, those are three pieces of the puzzle we'll talk about. And then the topography, which is amazing around here because all the different elevation changes. We basically forecast for eight different regions of our state of New Hampshire on any given one storm that comes in. And every one of those eight can be completely different when a storm is moving in and it's around 32 degrees. We do get everything here but volcanoes. It was also pointed out to me by a kindergarten class last week that we also don't get tsunamis. It was not one of my better days. But you get the point. So here's the list. Three floods in 18 months. A tornado on the ground for 50 miles. An ice storm where half the state is without power. 10 feet of snow in one season, and it's probably not the winter you can. Irene, Sandy, snowstorm that probably wreaked havoc on your trick-or-treating five, six years ago, because it happened two days before Halloween. And then to was $200 million in weather damage in it's an amazing amount. More than half of it was from floods. We had the Alstead flooding in western New Hampshire, and then the Mother's Day flood, which affected a large chunk of the state, which was six to as much as 11 inches of rain in three or four days. A really 
different things happen during that flood that we don't see every day. It's called an avulsion. Basically, the Suncook River, which is actually under a flood warning this morning, um, rose so high that it found a lower place to go for about a mile and a half. This is what's left of where the river was. A bunch of sand and silt will trickle the river going down. But now there is a neighborhood that has riverfront property that never thought they would. But this avulsion is still moving today. And so Department of Environmental Services in Concord, they have a scientist for every river in the state of New Hampshire. It's fascinating to go there for a scientist. When you go there, though, it's not huge monitors and a really cool scene. It's just a big cubicle farm, basically, more than anything else. But Stephen Landry, who runs the Suncook River, that's his job, basically, for the rest of his career, is trying to keep this river contained where it is because it's still moving. We went there for the 10-year anniversary a couple of years ago, and he pointed across the river to a cornfield. And he said, in about two years, that cornfield's going to be gone. And that's basically the way large main stem rivers go. We see it with flooding up here all the time. You have, if you look at Google Earth, these main stem rivers, you'll notice these little curve shaped lakes around the outside. They're called oxbows, but basically they were where the river used to be until a larger flood came along and kind of naturally straightened it out. So you'll notice a lot of them, like the Merrimack River and the Connecticut River, are relatively straight compared to the ones that are flooding all the time, like the Tamajuasa, which is notorious for flooding. As far as I'm concerned, it is the number one flooding river in the entire state of New Hampshire. Picture of State Flooding, April 2007, literally just went by the 10 year anniversary of that, and this is probably the closest April to what we're in right now. Part of how we seasonally forecast the weather is looking at similar patterns in similar seasons of the year. So there's several Aprils that are exactly like this one. It may seem like this is the longest winter ever, but we've had them before. Matter of fact, this flooding happened this past weekend back in 2007. Uh, 1983, 2007, 1998. All three Aprils then produced cooler than average temperatures for the summer. I know no one wants to hear that, so there's a reason I haven't said that on television. <laughs> you have to know your audience. I, I don't have a tremendous bedside manner on TV, but I am not ready to kind of kick people while they're down right now. We'll let them figure all that out on their own as we get there. But this is kind of how things go. The colder the temperatures in November, usually the more snow we get that following winter. You can find these little connections along the way. They're not perfect, but they work pretty well a lot of the time. As far as that November thing, uh, if we're colder than a couple of degrees colder than normal in November, we're always above average for snow going back to 1962. It works really well. I did send that information, and this kind of gives you an idea of the difference between climate scientists and meteorologists. Climate scientists study past trends to try to figure out the future. They, they work on different time scales. They work in hundreds, if not thousands, of years backward. So we emailed, Josh, Judge, and I figured this out. We kept going back all the way to 1962 till we found an exception for this November into winter. And we emailed the state climatologist, pretty excited. The email we got back was kind of a verbal pat on the head. Like, that's cute. Tell me what else you find. So there's that. Um, but it works really, really well, and worked really well for this winter. We were colder than normal in November, and boom, there we are. So what was happening? This is annual precipitation, rain and melted snow for six consecutive years starting in 2005. It wasn't our imagination. It is not just a laundry list of media made up storms with all fancy names to them. We were getting a, a lot of precipitation. Now the average annual precipitation for Concord, and these numbers go back to 1870, is about 37 and a half. So all five of these, all six of these years, first, second, third, fourth, 14th, and 24th all time. Pretty amazing number. Ice storm in 2008, half the state was without power. Before we had the ice storm in 2008, what was known as the ice storm here in New Hampshire was back in 1998. And with that one, we didn't have nearly the power outages. It was mostly elevations. And it was mostly a southern Canada and northern Vermont situation that picked up more of the outages on. But this, about almost 800 power poles had to be replaced, and 13 of those little 
power stations known as uh, transformers had to be completely revamped. Um, we'll talk about why we've had a lot of outages coming up. October Norway through 2011. Here's what makes this storm that happened on a weekend so amazing. I am sitting there during the noon show on a Friday trying to predict snow. And my map has 6 to 12 inches of snow. Huge band across central and southern New Hampshire. Well, because I enjoy the weather history part, I was staring at this. Which are the snowiest Octobers in Concord going back to 1870. And I'm predicting 6 to 12 inches of snow, thinking I must be crazy. We wound up with 22. So it was off any chart that we had ever had to that point. It probably makes this one probably the craziest of all the storms. Again, more outages. 2008 tornado, thankfully it didn't affect here per se, uh, but went basically up the eastern side of New Hampshire through 13 different towns moving 45 miles an hour. At one point there's damage just off Route 16 in Ossipi that's over a mile wide. So it can happen here, they just don't happen very often. The cautionary tale, 11.30 in the morning to one in the afternoon on a, wind, on a Thursday in July, is if that track of that storm had been about 20 miles west, instead of hitting, you know, uh, Epsom, Barnstead, Wolfboro, this thing is hitting Nashua, Manchester, Concord, and the Lakes region in the middle of the day in July. It could have been infinitely <coughs> a lot worse. Last time we had one on the ground that long, almost 200 years ago. The Joe for the 1821 one that happened was, it happened near Lebanon through Concord. It has basically carved out the river valley for I-89. It's not a funny joke, it's just a joke. But the, the takeaway here is that it injured hundreds of people. We didn't have a lot of people in New Hampshire in 1821. That one was apparently very visible. And there's apparently someone writing a book about that today, as we come up on the 200th. They say tornadoes are kind of a way of life here. We just don't get a lot of them. A lot of space in between them. Some are good timing, bad timing. The one on May 5th in Berlin seems really early in the season, and it is. It snowed the day before. Uh, caused one, uh, one million dollars in weather damage in 1929. It happened on a Sunday, though, when everything was closed. We were back back in the 20s. Things were closed on Sundays. They aren't really anymore. And then the bad timing was July 4th, 1898, Hampton Beach. It is, as you imagine. 10 feet of snow in one season. This happened back in 2007, 2008. What you need to happen are the three things that I'm gonna to talk to you about here in just a second that make the winter go on and on and on. You may remember just a couple of winters ago, we had a Thanksgiving storm and we had that January through March, which was just insane really cold and really snowy. Well, in December, we wound up with three inches of snow. The Mother Nature kind of took the foot off the pedal for four weeks. And when you do that, you're not going to wind up with 10 feet of snow in one season. The most we'd ever had was 122. So this was the most we'd had in one winter in over 100 years. So, while I'm not a climate scientist, I, I can't talk really about climate change or anything like that. It's not something I study. You can take all the weather events that we've had in the last 120 years and put them on a timeline. What we do know, and it's pretty obvious, that we, we go through cycles. The sun has its cycles, the oceans have their cycles. So temperatures generally will go up and down every 30 years or so. And because of the ocean currents and their cycles, it kind of has a tendency to go back and forth. What we do see is that when we're changing from one 30 year stretch to another, kind of like a localized cold front, that's when a lot of these extreme weather events happen. So from 1980 to about 2010, we were going through a warmer than normal stage. And now the ocean current's kind of flipping backwards, Pacific Ocean first, Atlantic Ocean second. We're now headed in the other direction. During that time, we had a lot of these events going on. So that means probably in another 25 years, we'll probably have another run at this as we go from cooler to warmer again. So, I did a series a couple of years ago called Weather or Not, and I asked emergency management, I said, here's the list of all the storms we've had, what are you most concerned about? This was the resounding answer even before I finished asking the question. Hurricane of 38. 
Hurricane of 38 knocked down one out of every three trees in New England. Fast moving hurricane, time it all got up through here, going through Long Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, still had winds over 120 miles an hour. So, here's the website. It is called historicarials.com. Aerials is an aerial photo. You click on the viewer on the top of the screen, and you can plug in any street address. And what it will do is it will take you back through decades of satellite pictures over that location. You can see what your house looked like in 1970. What you're going to notice as you go through the decades is back in the 60s there weren't nearly as many trees as there are now. We have gone 80 years since a hurricane of 38. And that's basically what's going on is everything for the last 80 years has been allowed to just grow. So then we go through the last 12 years, ice storms, snowstorms, thunderstorm events, and we're going to have a lot more outages, and that's really where we are. It's a beautiful state we live in, but we can't snip around every single power line in the state of New Hampshire. So when we do have one of these big storms, or a couple of gusts over 60 miles an hour, we're going to have outages, and that's why we have a lot more now than we did even 20 or 30 years ago. I am not saying we need a hurricane to naturally clear cut things. I'm not saying because it's been 80 years that we're all of a sudden you know, going to have one next year. That's not really how weather works. Weather is its own kind of independent roll of the dice. But if it's happened before, it could happen again. And emergency management thinks that there could be areas of our state that are without power for six to eight weeks if something like this happened now because of all the timber. If you go back through history, the White Mountains were just destroyed by this hurricane. There's some amazing stories of people taking a lot of that fallen wood that's out in the forest and putting them into lakes to preserve them until they could get a sawmill for that. Uh, back in 38, we were in war. There wasn't as much manpower out there to run the sawmills. So they actually had female sawmill crews. They called lumber jills, believe it or not. That would change the uh, logo pretty quickly, wouldn't it? Lumber jills instead of lumber jacks. Um, but there's some amazing stories from the Hurricane of 38. One of the professors at Clinton State University wrote a book about the Hurricane of 38. And it just makes you realize that a lot of the other stuff we've gone through, while big storms, it's not that. And I think that's probably one of the things about my knowledge of Three. That also never happens again. Storms coming off the sun, solar flares, geomagnetic storms get to Earth. Our magnetic field is wonderful. It protects us from most of it. Most of the time, it's this harmless northern lights that we see in the sky. We do have a history of those stronger magnetic storms getting to Earth and disrupting power grids and satellites. With as reliant as we are these days in our digital technology, we have to be prepared for something like this. We don't have Bruce Willis or Superman to go up there and make a stronger magnetic field. We just have to be prepared for something. Finally, blizzards, which are wonderful when they happen on weekends like they did in 2013 and 2014. Everyone could just stay home. But let's say we're in early March and you've already burned six, seven, eight, nine snow days, and it's a Friday morning. Snow's not supposed to start till noon, but let's say it starts at like 9 30, 10 o'clock. And you're already scheduled early release. It didn't happen on my watch, I'm off that day. And so they decide to keep you at school because it's unsafe. There's already five inches. And then the wind picks up and then the power starts to go out in school. These are the kind of things, while it sounds like a horror movie, are the things that emergency management's always thinking about trying to safeguard. So I realize that there are going to be some days where it's just lightly snowing outside and they delay or cancel. What they're trying to do is safeguard from a lot of these bad timing things to happen like it was in the blizzard of 78. All right. Other things on the list, floods and flash floods. Flash floods are the thunderstorms that don't move. Uh, I referenced right around July 4th last year where that thunderstorm didn't move and we had eight, nine, ten inches of rain in about four or five hours. It causes some pretty amazing flooding. Uh, ice jams are when the ice is moving along the rivers. It eventually finds a narrower spot and then the water rushes off. Avulsion. Ice storm drops. All right. 
was wrong this year, right? He said only six he more weeks away. This morning that they wanted to arrest him. The New York police put out a, who was telling me that? Put out a, um, yeah. Barbecue groundhog day. Uh-huh. Or is that more extreme? So, the three things, and I'll leave open this up to any questions you guys have, the three things that guide a winter. You're going to ask me in October, what's the winter going to be like? Well, these are going to seem pretty far removed, but so is the warming and cooling of the Pacific Ocean, known as El Nino. The wind over the Arctic, it's moving really fast. There's no daylight in the middle of the winter. That cold air stays there. It gets bottled up. The wind is lighter. It can come down parts of the hemisphere. Oscillation means that it kind of goes back and forth. Usually the wind speeds will vary. Sometimes it'll be really fast in the winter. Sometimes it will slow down, but usually one more than the other. And it doesn't mean the cold air is coming here. It could be Europe, it could be Russia, it could be Greenland, it could be us. And if you remember early January, that's when it hit us. Second oscillation is over the Northern Atlantic Ocean, basically Greenland. When a high or a low sits there and doesn't move, it basically bottles up the entire weather pattern and creates a weather traffic jam in the atmosphere. Um, once we went through the very warm stretch in February, we saw the weather pattern slowing down. Blocking is what we call it. But this is what caused those three or four nor'easters to come directly up the coast that were not happening in the middle of the winter. It basically was a huge high over Greenland that stopped the jet stream from going west and east. So when the storm develops over North Carolina, can't move out over the sea because the jet stream's not moving, it comes up the coast and gets us. So when you have the cold air coming south with the Arctic Oscillation and then you have the blocking, that's when you get three or four storms at once. That's basically exactly what was going on for us. Now the third falls under research. Um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology really has been studying this well over the last 15 years. Some Novembers into Decembers, some Marches into Aprils, the weather warms up over the Arctic for about three to four weeks, greater than anywhere around it. And then after that, this happens. It's basically like a hurricane going over warm ocean water. It upwells the cooler water from underneath. Once this changes from very warm for three to four weeks to cool, it's called sudden stratosphere forming, that's when the weather pattern goes crazy. Sure enough, the Arctic air was coming south, the weather pattern was slowing down, and this was developing see them all developing in early February, and we knew that March was going to be a very different month. So while everyone was enjoying the very warm temperatures and the record highs and everything else in February, we were very quick to caution people that winter was by no means over. And if anything, it may get stubborn on the other side. That all being said, this is probably the end of it tomorrow. It'll be a little cool Friday and Saturday, but then as we get into early next week, we're probably done with most of what you would call winter. <laughs> Just in time. As a matter of fact, our first half of next week looks gorgeous. Uh, above 60. Um, I think there'll probably be some rain Wednesday or Thursday, but it's not like we're going to just all of a sudden change back to snow and then we're going back into this the following weekend. I think we are pretty much done. On that good news, any questions? About anything weather, anything television. I think I went over my entire career in 25 minutes. Any questions? Yes. study the glaciers. It's pretty amazing stuff and they keep some of those glaciers 
and the information for future research. Um, I can imagine it is very cold there all the time, including in the middle of the winter. Yes? Did you always want to be a meteorologist? I didn't know if I wanted to do the TV thing. I, I have not, even though I've talked for 20 or 25 minutes, that that is not, you know, something I get up every morning wanting to talk to people. That's not my thing. Um, you have to understand, when, when I'm doing my job, it's me and a camera in a studio, and usually two anchors not paying attention to anything I'm saying. So I, I'm just basically talking to myself. Um, and I love the school of business. It's, I, I don't do this to be heard. That's not my meaning of life. Um, I, I, I enjoy the, my happy place probably in the morning is sitting there from 2.30 to 3.30 in the morning looking at all the maps. I, I enjoy trying to predict the future. I enjoy that, that, the challenge of that because it is a challenge. It, it's not every day partly sunny 60 degrees all the time. Um, especially when you have those 10 days a year that the weather is a little bit chaotic or the maps completely disagree one day before a snowstorm's getting here. That's really when it's most stressful for us. The television part really isn't stressful. At, at five in the morning, our main goal in life is to just look awake on television, let alone to be stressed or, or nervous or anything else. Um, that kind of went away 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's, it is a fun job because I enjoy the weather part about what I do, and I enjoy talking about weather. As can be evidenced by these three school visits I've been to, you guys being the third. Yes? There's, much like the laundry list I just showed you a few minutes ago, there's a laundry list for that too. Um, in, a, in a smaller scale, warm fronts are deadly for meteorologists because the maps will tell you all day that on a really cold morning, the warm front's gonna come through and it's gonna turn 60 in the afternoon. Well, this would be an example along with Franklin, Newfound Lake, Bristol, and I could, I could go on and on about the towns, including Plymouth, where the temperature doesn't warm, even though the rest of the state does, including Whitefield and Burlington. And it has to do with just the topography of this area. When you are in between where um, I-91 is and I-93, there is this little bowl that you'll see on a topographical map. The cold air sinks. And unless the wind is incredibly strong, mixing the warm air, Mount Washington will be warmer than down here. It, it will make us wrong by 25 to 30 degrees. To the point now that we mention that every single time one of those situations occurs. I've been burned enough by it over the years that I will mention the stubborn central valleys of New Hampshire and I will list three or four towns to give people an idea because I have been burned a zillion times on it. Snowstorms, it's tough because we'll put a range of six to 12 inches of snow across a part of the state. But you know a higher terrain area is gonna pick up 14 or 15. You know there are gonna be some spots that change terrain and wind up with four, but you can't put four to 17 on a map. So you're kind of hedging your bets in the middle. And so there, there is a certain game we play in doing that. Um, at the same time, your best defense is just to be honest with people on television. If you are not confident with how things are gonna play out, you tell people that on television over and over and over again, and hopefully they catch the one. Because most of the time, people are going to look at their phone and see the graphic with the snowfall bands. Or they're going to see an app, and they're going to think that's just the forecast and that's it. There's no way to describe. At 7.30 every morning, I do a Facebook post live on my Facebook page where we talk for 15 or 20 minutes, and I answer questions from people. And I am probably way too honest on there every single morning. But it gives me a chance to kind of show people that there is an indifference. I answer questions that people have. They're going to be in North Conway at 2 o'clock on Sunday. What's the weather going to be? And I literally will make the forecast for them right on the fly. And people see that indecision. They see us thinking about it, which they don't see at 2 or 3 in the morning. They just see the two and a half minutes we do at 5 o'clock. Yep. How early do you go to bed? What's that? How early do you go to bed? Not early enough. Um, I have a third grader at home. And so he is, we're up reading books at like 8.30, 9 o'clock most nights, which is good because he's in third grade and he's reading books. But 
Um, it, it is not, uh, you know, a lot of sleep most of the time. I had a day off yesterday. I took a nap yesterday afternoon because I could. <laughs> you would think I'd be out doing something else fun. No, I'm napping. Uh, it's it's a 1.30 alarm clock, and you just you do what you have to do for your job. And I enjoy my job thoroughly. I really do. The hours are obviously the tough part, but at the same time, the other option is working from 2.30 in the afternoon to midnight, which is not good when you have a third grader because you hardly ever see him. So, you kind of weigh your options off. Yep. You mentioned um, feedback that you get from viewer audience. Oh, we call it feedback. Well, That's good. That's very diplomatic. Uh, so, what, how do you receive negative feedback? Do you get a lot of emails? Or? Emails, Facebook comments. And, and is it common, like, F daily, regularly? How often? Not daily. Not daily. And they blame you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it sounds funny, doesn't it? I, I like to think that in the hundred of school visits I do a year, for the last 10 or 12 years, that the kids that I even started talking to in, let's say, second grade 13 years ago, they're now in college. And so if they, if all of these school kids eventually live in New Hampshire, by the time I'm ready to retire, first of all, some of them are gonna be coming for my job. But second of all, they all kind of understand what's going on. But a lot of the adults, they see all the computers that we use today, and they just assume that because the computers make it much easier to predict, that we should be much better at forecasting. And what I usually tell people is, is yeah, I mean, we're doing seven day forecasts now. We're talking about a winter storm five days before it's out there in the ocean coming at us. But there's only so much information we can give when it finally gets here, because then it's down to town by town. <coughs> and that's when it gets really, really difficult. Um, yeah. One of my, probably my kryptonites is, is bedside manner with people. I, I, I again, I, I'm, I'm honest. Uh, okay. Probably to a fault sometimes. Uh, but that's just, maybe it's just so early in the morning I'm not, I'm not enough coffee in yet. But that is probably, you know, one of the very few negatives to, to the job that I have. Do you guys like to be on television? No? Yeah. I hate it. All right. I bring a small video camera with me, which allows me to take video and bring it back to the station and show it on television. Yes? I have a question. Sure. So as the athletic director here, this is fine. Let's do a game tomorrow. You do? Four o'clock. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to critique you. Are we going to get that in? It's here in Lincoln, not in Manchester. Which it's outdoors. Is what sport? Baseball, softball. Okay. You realize it's only going to be like 40 degrees tomorrow. Okay. We'll find one today. They're playing anyway, right? So I'm talking about stuff flying out of the air. It's going to be lightly rain. Slightly rain? Lightly rain. Oh, darling. Light rain more than a drizzle. More than It'll be light rain. So like, okay. Steady light rain. Steady light rain. <laughs> so I'm calling, I'm telling you, Chancellor. Thank you. Thanks for nothing, right? Hi, camera. See, that, that is how you, yeah. That's pretty much what Facebook Live shows up to be every morning at 7. So what I'll do is I'll pan around the room, you guys wave at the camera, and it's 6.45 tomorrow morning. Yeah? Well, I'm not going to be up either, trust me. I'm there, but I'm not awake. Um, I'll do my whole weather segment at the end of the seven day. I'll mention that I was here in the video that we shoot now. We'll be on After it airs, we post it up on our website somewhere mid to late morning. And after I post it, then you can bookmark it and have it forever. It will probably also be on the app. So if you look on the app and look under just local videos, local news, it'll be there. And it'll probably be on YouTube as well. YouTube? How about that? If YouTube. Not with antics or anything, just 
It's just you guys ready? YouTube. Alright. No. Please no. Uh. Hi! <laughs> <laughs>